the subarachnoid space. It's kind of a cushioning layer of fluid, which gives some mechanical insulation uh, as if the brain undergoes an impact. <clears throat> Now, uh, the pressure in this fluid, uh, this um, sub, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, is what's known as the intracranial pressure. And under normal circumstances, it's uh, fairly uniform across uh, the brain. And it's about eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. So, well, millimeters of mercury is quite an uh, archaic measurement, but that's about 1,000 to 1,600 pascals. Uh, and more crucially, it's about 10% of uh, normal arterial pressure at, at the heart. Uh, so, uh, so um, it's, it's uh, significant on the scale of the body, but, but nowhere near as, as large as uh, arterial pressure. <clears throat> and so, uh, well, this is just a picture of the, uh, the, the skull, but the, the, the eyes, uh, which develop from uh, the same tissue uh, during uh, embryogenesis, uh, are, are essentially sitting here toward the front. Uh, now, the eyes themselves, they, they, they develop from the same tissue, so there is a, a lot of connection between uh, the two, but they are still relatively mechanically independent. So the, so the, the human eye is confined within uh, its own uh, bony structure in the skull, known as the orbit, or essentially the, the eye socket. Uh, and then within that eye socket, it's also cushioned by a, a thick layer of fat. And so that gives the eye some, or quite a lot of mechanical independence from uh, the brain. Now the eye itself, again, this is a picture that you, you may have seen at school. I just uh, want to make sure everyone's sort of in, in line with the, 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 the bi biology. I'm going to then lead into the maths in a second. So um, what we've got uh, is the eye is essentially formed from a, as a spherical annulus of a, a thick stiff tissue known as the sclera. That's the, the white bit of your eye. Uh, and so inside that annulus is a, a, a vitreous, like a jelly-like uh, fluid. Now, of course, there's a hole in that sclera at the front, and that allows light to come in. And so the light coming in, you go through the lens, and then it's beamed onto the interior surface of that annulus uh, to a region known as the retina. And the retina is essentially composed of uh, light-sensitive cells known as uh, photoreceptors. Uh, and so they interpret the light coming in, and then they send a signal to the brain uh, so that uh, the brain can then interpret what uh, the eye is seeing. <clears throat> And so uh, these uh, photoreceptors in this, uh, in this retinal region, which is the pink region in, in, that I've labeled on my picture, uh, communicate with the brain through uh, dendritic fibers. And these fibers are all collected together into one region uh, at the back of the eye uh, known as the optic nerve. So essentially it's a big thick cable with all these fibers uh, going back toward the brain. And so the optic nerve is gonna be uh, key to what I uh, go on to show later today. But just before I get to the optic nerve, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, the eye receives its blood supply, because again, that's quite crucial to uh, the concept of retinal hemorrhaging. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a similar schematic of uh, the human eye. Uh, and so uh, in humans and higher mammalian species, uh, the eye has actually two separate blood supplies. Uh, so they're both coming as bifurcations of uh, the ophthalmic artery and vein, but they are relatively distinct uh, once they enter the eye. Now, this detail is just more for, for, for context. Uh, essentially, there, are, there is what's known as the, the retinal circulation, uh, and that's a, 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 a circulation of blood vessels which is uh, close to the surface of the retina. And so for a clinician looking into the eye, those vessels are uh, fairly visible. So this is a image on the right hand side is a, is a picture of the inside of the eye and you can see these uh, thick red lines uh, are essentially the uh, blood vessels of the retinal circulation. Uh, and the retinal circulation, uh, as well as being visible, is really interesting mathematically because it is uh, quite closed because there's only one way in and one way out and that's through uh, these vessels which enter at uh, the optic disc or enter essentially through the optic nerve. So there's a, uh, the, the central retinal artery is entering through the optic nerve is then branching out into this network that you can see on the image. Uh, then we have the capillaries and then they branch back through uh, the veins all the way back to the optic disc again, where you have uh, the central, re central retinal vein, which is leaving uh, and going back along the optic nerve. So we've got one in and one out, which makes it quite uh, nice to be able to study without having to study the entire circulation system. Now, there is a second circulation and known as the choroidal circulation. So the choroid is a, a dense layer of blood vessels which lies below the retina, so basically between the retina and the sclera. Uh, and the choroid is fed from without. So there are blood vessels entering uh, through the sclera and into the choroid. Uh, and so they form that the, essentially speed the choroidal circulation. But uh, the choroid is not typically visible as you look into the eye. And so it's not um, 
uh, for retinal hemorrhaging, it's, it's, it's less important. You still can get uh, bleeding of the choroid, and that's uh, very serious. But uh, in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, it's going to be uh, bleeding of uh, the retinal circulation, essentially bursting of some of these vessels, causing blood to leak out onto the retina. So that's what's known as a retinal hemorrhage. And it's all uh, it's, well, it's going to be assumed to be associated with the retinal circulation. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, that's the blood supply. And now coming back to the optic nerve, which I said was kind of the key bridge between uh, the eye and the brain. Uh, so I've already said some of this. Essentially, it's the, it's the, the collection of fibers which lead from uh, the photoreceptors receptors to uh, the brain. Now, uh, careful measurement of uh, the optic nerve and uh, the blood vessels which go through it uh, wasn't really undertaken until uh, the 1960s. So uh, Hera in uh, a series of papers uh, from about 1960 onwards, very carefully measured uh, in uh, postmortem lots of different um, uh, optic nerve properties and, and the uh, size of the vessels and, and, and uh, their geometry going through. And uh, what's from that work onwards, it's become clear that the optic nerve, uh, as you can see here, uh, has a region of tissue outside. So this, this boundary that I'm sketching out with my mouse, that's essentially the edge of the nerve fibers. Uh, and then above that, we actually have a meningeal region, which is essentially uh, the same as the meningeal region going around the brain. And in particular, the meninges of the brain contain this subarachnoid space that I talked about a few minutes ago, containing the cerebral spinal fluid. And so essentially, the, we don't need to worry too much about the, the, the details of this picture, apart from the fact that there is a layer of fluid all the way uh, around uh, the outer surface of the optic nerve. And that, that, that um, subarachnoid space, or in this case, optic nerve subarachnoid space, or what I'll call onsas, is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And there is a direct connection between that cerebral spinal fluid and the cerebral spinal fluid which surrounds the brain. And so, and there is an inlet in the orbit, uh, essentially the, 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 the bone of the skull, to, to allow fluid to directly communicate between the two. And that, that's known as the optic frame. And, and that'll come up in some of the models that I put together in a few minutes. <clears throat> As I've already said, that the, the pressure in uh, the fluid in this optic nerve subarachnoid space is uh, pretty much comparable to the pressure in the brain. And so there have been studies in, under normal circumstances looking at the correlation between these two pressures, and uh, they're pretty much linear. Uh, and so uh, under normal circumstances, uh, as I keep saying, uh, this pressure is a fairly good indication of the intracranial pressure. <clears throat> now, um, and I'll come to why that's uh, really uh, interesting in, in a few minutes. Uh, so what I keep saying about under normal circumstances, and that the reason for that is because what we really want to study uh, today uh, is what happens when uh, the brain undergoes an injury. Now that injury could um, originate from lots of different sources, uh, a blow to the head, uh, or uh, a very unpleasant to think about, but quite important in the context of this work. Uh, application is in a shaken baby syndrome, where uh, non-accidental head injury in infants, um, and uh, some of the, the, the retinal hemorrhages that I am going to talk about can occur as a result of that. And so it's important to try and understand uh, how those can arise and, and uh, what we can say about their origin. And so just thinking about a traumatic brain injury for uh, a second. So this is not a traumatic brain injury. This is just a movie of um, uh, sort of slow-mo guys. They're a, they're a channel on YouTube. Uh, essentially, what's going to happen is that this guy's going to get hit on the side of the face with a football, and they're going to visualize it in slow motion. Uh, so if I play them, you'll see it, first of all, in real time, and then they'll slow it right down. Uh, and you can see, uh, as the ball is impacting on uh, the head, that there are quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of deformation going on, even at this relatively low speed and low impact. So you can see uh, elastic waves propagating in the tissue. And uh, this rapid deformation would be associated with quite a large increase in the intracranial pressure. Now, that increase might not be sustained. In fact, it probably won't be. The pressure will go up and then come back down again. So as I said, intracranial pressure is usually about 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury. Uh, an impact like this might, might raise it to maybe 50, 60, 70 millimeters of mercury transiently and then come back down again. And so the, 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 this has very little long-term effect uh, on uh, the body. But of course, if that pressure rise was to be much greater or was to be sustained over a longer time, then we can imagine that, that things would get uh, tricky, especially if the intracranial pressure uh, reached arterial levels, where, where it would then be comparable to uh, the arterial uh, blood flow going through uh, the brain. So um, that's background on uh, traumatic brain injury. And there are lots of studies across the world of, of, of uh, groups looking at uh, the mechanics of uh, traumatic brain injury. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. For the purposes of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, traumatic brain injury is essentially just an increase in intracranial pressure that happens over some time scale, which is very fast. 
And so retinal hemorrhaging, as I said before, that's bleeding of these blood vessels inside the retina is actually a clinical indicator of traumatic brain injury. So in uh, perhaps uh, patients who uh, has an injury of some sort, a clinician will repeatedly look into their eyes as one way of monitoring what's going on with a traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> and the reason they do that is uh, twofold. Well, first of all, it's very, very easy. So it's, it's, it's much simpler than, than, than scanning uh, the, the patient and much safer for the patient as well, rather than doing repeated CT scans. Um, but also, it's, uh, there's a very strong correlation between the presence of retinal hemorrhaging and uh, the severity of brain injury. <clears throat> now, uh, as well as uh, in uh, just standard traumatic brain injury, there's uh, retinal hemorrhaging, presence of retinal hemorrhages is also one of the, the triad of indicators that's used for diagnosing shaken baby syndrome. And so uh, in uh, these uh, cases, it's often very important to be able to tell uh, whether the, the injury was severe and, and basically having retinal uh, hemorrhage is, is an indication of severity. <clears throat> and in uh, pathological cases, uh, this retinal hemorrhaging is often accompanied by bleeding along the optic nerve as well. So we, not just bleeding of the uh, retinal blood vessels, but actually bleeding uh, around the optic nerve. But obviously, that's only really uh, possible to tell that in postmortem. So that's, it's, it's hard to know how widespread that is in, in less severe cases. <clears throat> so essentially, retinal hemorrhaging is uh, the 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 topic of today's talk, I want to put together some mathematical models, which will hopefully, although we're not quite all the way there yet, lead to uh, a model, a predictive model to uh, understand retinal hemorrhage in more detail. And so what we then did was to look at, well, what, what the mechanisms that, that the clinicians uh, believe causes retinal hemorrhaging. <clears throat> so uh, there are two uh, competing hypotheses. Um, so I'll talk about the more recent one first. That's the, the, the mechanism that was just postulated by Greenwald in 1986. Uh, it's known as vitreal retinal traction. <clears throat> and so essentially their hypothesis for the origin of retinal hemorrhaging is essentially that the, the vitreous, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, jelly-like fluid inside the eye uh, under some injury, perhaps shaking or other injury, uh, the vitreous it rotates or, or and, and imposes a tractional force on the retina because they are uh, adhered at least uh, in in young younger people, and so uh, that traction that the vitreous is exerting on the retina can essentially uh, tear apart the retinal layers and cause the blood vessels to burst. And so essentially, this uh, mechanism of retinal hemorrhaging would be due to essentially a tearing of blood vessels uh, through externally imposed tractions coming from uh, the uh, the vitreous. And say this was posted in 1986. In the years that followed, it became essentially uh, amongst clinicians, it was, it was very widely accepted. And uh, it was only more recently that it started to be uh, questioned in, in quite uh, a few studies now. So most of the clinicians that I've talked to, uh, several uh, eminent um, ophthalmologists and pathologists uh, across uh, the UK, and all of them question this vitreal retinal traction mechanism. It's, it's uh, when, when the clinical evidence stacked up and there's been a number of papers that have looked at individual cases and tried to square that with uh, what the observation of those cases to, to this mechanism and there's, there's, there's a lot of discrepancy. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a nice paper by Clark et al in uh, 2009 in, in I which essentially describes quite a number of different cases which don't fit this vitreal retinal traction uh, hypothesis. And so I'll not go into the details of that. But essentially this mechanism has been questioned. And so attention has now turned to uh, an older mechanism that was postulated in uh, 1967, which was uh, due to Gilkes and Mann, uh, and it's uh, known as the pressure rise hypothesis. So in this, it sort of happens that the process is, is thought to happen in stages. Essentially, there is a pressure increase in uh, the brain, uh, like I was talking about uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, the idea is that it's then transmitted uh, to uh, the onsas, so the optic nerve subarachnoid space, because they're connected, as I talked about. Uh, before. And then, uh, and again, we'll come into the details of this, uh, it's thought that that pressure increase is then transmitted to the retinal blood vessels, and so then propagates into the eye, and then spreads through the retinal circulation. So that this network of, of vessels that you can see on the screen, uh, essentially that the, the disturbance will enter at the optic disc, and then start spreading out through the blood vessels. And as it spreads, um, essentially these vessels are getting smaller and smaller, potentially weaker and weaker, and eventually, uh, you would expect uh, one of the vessels to rupture if the pressure difference is large enough. So essentially you're inducing a, a large transmural pressure, and particularly in the veins, which are uh, quite weak, uh, you, you might expect a rupture. And so that's indeed what they see clinically, that often it's uh, the, the, the venous side where they see the, the most significant ruptures. 
And so this is the, the, the pressure rise hypothesis. And essentially, it's this hypothesis that uh, I would like to provide some theoretical uh, evidence for from uh, mathematical modeling. And so what I'm going to do today, this, this slide essentially forms an outline for the rest of my talk. I'm going to go through uh, these four different points, or at least or the first three of these points, and impose mathematical models for each stage, and then look at how the system uh, responds and, 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 and uh, what we can understand using mathematical modeling. We haven't yet got to the stage of looking at uh, rupture processes in uh, this tree, but we've uh, got the other three sort of uh, modeled in some form. So yeah, so I'm going to now go through and talk about three different models. So uh, part one, uh, this is essentially looking at uh, what happens along the optic nerve. So, so uh, assuming that the pressure rises in the brain, uh, how then does uh, the, this get communicated? What, what happens essentially along the optic nerve? And so I should say this was uh, Thompson Spellman, who is the co-author for pretty much all of this talk, uh, was my postdoc uh, for a few years. And so she uh, did an excellent job. Uh, and so almost all the simulations in, in this study are, are hers. Uh, this is also work with Richard Bonchek, who is recently retired, but was a, uh, a leading uh, uh, ocular pathologist uh, in, in Manchester, actually. Uh, and uh, it's also based on work that I did with others at the Mass and Medicine Study Group in 2014. Uh, so th their names are, are also listed here. So, so there's, this is it was based on initial work in the study group, then I've developed it a bit further. And then I'll go on to show how we then take this idea from the optic nerve and extend it into the retina. <clears throat> so uh, this I've already shown this picture, so I'm not going to go into any detail. This is just the histology of the optic nerve. But what I want to now do is turn this um, histological image into a uh, a mathematical cartoon that I can then form a model for. And so uh, what I'm now doing is taking my optic nerve, I'm going to model it as a uh, rigid cylinder, uh, and that's this pink region that I've got down here. And then around the outside of that, I'm going to have a, uh, a fluid filled layer, essentially an annulus, a, a cylindrical annulus of uh, incompressible fluid, which is going to be my CSF. Uh, that uh, region is actually going to be bounded by, uh, uh, it's closed-ended, so there's, there's no direct connection any further than, than we can see here. So essentially the, the sclera, the, the white part of the eye, forms uh, a rigid barrier through which um, the, the fluid can't permeate. Uh, and so what we're going to do is look at how, the, if I now change the pressure in the brain, which is on the right-hand side as you, as you look at it, how the, if that pressure changes, what then happens to uh, the fluid inside the optic nerve subarachnoid space? <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, well, the modeling assumptions, uh, I'm not going to this in, in too much detail. Essentially, it's a very simple model. So the, the fluid is, is uh, homogeneous, Newtonian. Actually, it's inviscid for most of what I talk about uh, today. Uh, and uh, we're going to say that the uh, PMA, matter, that's the bit of the meninges that's below the optic nerve subarachnoid space, is just going to be rigid. So it's basically formed into the, into the um, uh, cylindrical shape of the uh, optic nerve. And then we've got an elastic lid forming uh, the upper surface of uh, the uh, optic nerve subarachnoid space, which is essentially dura matter. Uh, and it's just going to be an elastic sheet with some stiffness, which I'm going to call capital K. And then um, even though this is a cylindrical flow, I'm going to be even more simplistic and just look at a 2D cross section and, and not worry about flow in uh, the azimuthal direction. So it's, it's a 2D model. And say, I'm going to uh, assume that viscous effects are uh, sufficiently slow that they can be neglected, given that everything here is going to happen relatively quickly because we're looking at uh, acute uh, traumatic brain injuries. And so I can just write down uh, the Euler equations which I've already non-dimensionalized here um, uh, in this form. So U is going to be my velocity field and P is the pressure. Uh, and uh, I should have said that X is going to be my coordinate which goes along uh, the surface of uh, the optic nerve. And then we've got two boundary conditions. Uh, we've got no penetration of flow through the optic nerve and uh, a kinematic condition on the upper surface. Now that's not quite a closed model, but before I get to how I close it, you can also uh, look at the geometry of this system. And you find that the, again, going back to, to, to the measurements of Hera from uh, 1960s, this optic nerve subarachnoid space is very narrow compared to its length. So an, uh, an adult uh, optic nerve is about 27 millimeters long, uh, whereas the thickness of this layer is on the order of about a millimeter. So it's pretty long and thin, and so you can use a shallow water approximation. And so that point, you can reduce your governing equations down to just two uh, one-dimensional PDEs, as in one-dimensional in the x-coordinate uh, along the optic nerve, uh, for the thickness, which I'm calling h, and u, which is going to be the fluid velocity. 
and P the pressure. So that's three unknowns in the system, uh, but uh, it's, so it's not closed yet. And this modeling approach just follows very closely to a lot of the early work that was done on uh, flow and flexible wall vessels. So I'm, I'm, the model itself is, is quite standard, but I now want to look at how uh, if we apply this model with uh, quite non-standard boundary conditions, we end up with quite interesting flows. I already said the system is not closed and we need a final condition for the fluid pressure. Uh, and so what we did, there's a, a few studies along, this, along these lines, but um, uh, the one that I found to be the most self-consistent is a study by Hansen uh, et al. from 2011. And so what they did uh, was measure uh, the thickness of the optic nerve sheath, that's basically the thickness of the entire optic nerve, uh, as a function of CSF pressure. Now, they weren't doing anything traumatic. This was all done just by raising the, the CSF pressure using uh, infusion tests. Uh, but essentially, they were able to form a correlation between CSF pressure and the thickness of the optic nerve subarachnoid space, which in some way gives us an indication of the elasticity of, of the dura matter in our model. And so we can then use this information to close our system. It gives us a way to, to basically pose what would be called a, a tube law, or in this case, a channel law, for uh, relating the, the, the excess pressure, the pressure above baseline, uh, to uh, the thickness of the channel compared to its baseline. So the, if I call the baseline pressure P0 and the baseline thickness H0, uh, the current pressure and the current thickness can be related through uh, a law a bit like this. So it, there's various forms of these laws have been posed through the years. What I'm doing is, is, is using a continuous one so that goes all the way from collapse to inflation, although actually in this case we never ever consider anything to do with collapse. So this, all I'm really worried about here is the inflation stage of my, my curve. And it's got um, a positive exponent minus a term with a negative exponent. And so that gives us a sort of uh, a, a shape like I've, I've, I've drawn here on the screen. Now, uh, the two exponents, M and N, are very much up for debate. Um, and, and it's from the data of Hansen, it's certainly not clear which, which exponent we should be using. Uh, now, the simplest thing, and what we have done is just model this as a linear function, so that uh, if I just use assume M is 1 and N is 0, uh, if you do that, you get the uh, a best fit, a very simple best fit through their data. You get the, the solid blue line that I've drawn here. Uh, and uh, if you do that, then you can then est back, back out what the stiffness of the dura matter must have been. And so that comes out to be about uh, 29 kilopascals <clears throat> under that assumption. Now, we know that having a linear law like this is probably not going to be very appropriate when the CSF pressure gets even larger than they've considered here uh, you know, into the traumatic regime. Uh, we, we don't expect the dura matter to be able to expand indefinitely. And so what we did was take a law that's commonly used for modeling uh, veins, uh, where we set uh, M to be 10 and N to be 3 over 2, although I say N doesn't matter because we're not looking at the collapse phase. Uh, and if you take that law, this nonlinear uh, channel law, you, you end up with um, a, a stiffness, which is a bit, a bit, quite a bit lower, of uh, about 800 pascals. <clears throat> and so I'm going to use both these fittings uh, as part of the, the results that come uh, in the rest of this uh, part of the talk. And so uh, just to show you what we're going to do, uh, it's fairly straightforward. I've got my, my blue region, which is my region of cerebrospinal fluid. I'm going to, uh, I've got my optic frame and I, I've, I've, I've sheeted it in pink here that, that, that there's, there is still fluid here. I just meant it to show that it's uh, a region where the, the flow is much more tightly confined by this inlet into uh, the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And so uh, what I'm going to do is apply a pressure perturbation on the far right of this domain as you look at it. That's simulating what's happening in the brain. That's then going to uh, drive a pressure wave into the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And any disturbance that I create will then not be able to penetrate through the sclera. Essentially, the sclera is, is rigid and impermeable under this assumption. So it's going to have to be a reflection at uh, this uh, uh, at sclera. And so just for simplicity, I'm going to apply a sinusoidal pressure uh, disturbance at this um, ends of the optic foramen. So it's going to look like a sine squared profile with some amplitude, which I'm going to call a delta P and uh, some time scale capital T. And that's, this has all been non-dimensionalized, but I, whenever I plot the, uh, the final results, I'm going to plot delta P as, as a pressure in millimeters of mercury, and I'm going to plot T as a time in seconds. So I, I have converted it back before I, before I plotted the results. <clears throat> We're going to then look at what happens to uh, flow inside this region on the uh, outside of the optic nerve. 
Uh, and so that's just me going, that's just a summary of the model. I've already said all that and a uh, summary of my boundary conditions. Uh, and so just to, to say, I'm uh, very indebted to the work of uh, Bindi Brook uh, from a journal fluid mechanics paper in 1999, where she put together uh, a very sophisticated uh, numerical method based on an upwind uh, Godunov scheme uh, for capturing a system that looked pretty much exactly like what I've given here. Uh, and the model was actually set up to capture uh, shocks, or, or in this case, what are known as elastic jumps. So uh, uh, propagation, propagating waves, which can have a, a discontinuity across their interface. Uh, and so we, she very kindly shared that uh, code with me, and we've been able to use that. And that's going to form the foundation of uh, both this part of the talk and uh, the other parts that are coming uh, in a few minutes. <clears throat> so uh, what does this system actually look like? So this is just a, a picture that my, my uh, this is all uh, rescaled. So my uh, optic nerves are right mode space between x equals zero and x equals one. And uh, my optic foramen is, is this region in red. And I'm applying a pressure disturbance uh, along the far right of this box. And so what I'm going to do is just apply a, a disturbance very, very quickly. So 0 0.005 seconds with uh, an amplitude of 20 millimeters of mercury. So that's, that's large uh, uh, on the context of the existing intracranial pressure, but it's not so large as to exceed arterial pressure. And so if I do that, what you get is that it generates a wave. That wave propagates uh, along the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And once it gets to uh, the sclera, uh, the wave is then reflected. So I'll show that again. You can see the wave steepening, and then it's reflected. And as it reflects, uh, you see an increase in uh, the corresponding pressure, quite a large increase in the pressure. So just to show that in slightly more detail, I'll show some stills uh, from the movie. So these first three panel, first three image, first three stills, sorry, in the in the first panel, uh, show essentially the propagating waveform moving uh, toward uh, the sclera, and then the two panels, uh, th sorry, three waveforms on the right hand side show uh, corresponding reflected waves, and so you can see that the, the reflected waves and the uh, transmitted waves look quite different, uh, but. The key thing I want to get across is this increase in pressure that happens at the sclera. So what we've got in, and this picture is one I'm going to use quite a bit uh, going forward in this section. So essentially I'm showing here, uh, the dashed line is the input pressure. That's the pressure I'm applying uh, to my system at the optic foramen. Uh, and then the corresponding black line is the measured pressure at the sclera. And so this is all using the nonlinear tube law or nonlinear channel law. <clears throat> and so what you see is a significant amplification uh, when the wave hits the it's the sclera. So there's nothing for a long time. The sclera is just sitting at its baseline pressure until suddenly it ex exhibits a spike. And that spike is uh, more than twice the input pressure. And that spike comes with an increased uh, pressure, essentially local to the sclera. And I'll come back to that uh, picture in a few minutes. <clears throat> so essentially this picture uh, of inputs in dashed and then outputs, or sorry, scleral uh, in, uh, as a solid line. If we then play with the time scale and, 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 and uh, apply this perturbation uh, faster and faster, so we do it uh, on at 0 0.01 seconds, picture's fairly unchanged, but now uh, the uh, first arrival at the sclera is, is uh, before the wave has been fully applied in, uh, at the optic foramen. As you continue to slow down as, as T gets larger and larger, uh, eventually you start to see an interaction between the incoming wave and uh, the, 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 the what's been reflected back from the sclera. So just to talk, talk through, so let's, let's take this picture here. This first line is what happens for 0 0.02 seconds. And so I'm applying, that's, the, that's this dashed line here. So I, I apply my pressure. Uh, the sclera doesn't exhibit any response initially. And then suddenly I get a spike, which is uh, significantly larger than the input, so it's about 50 millimeters of mercury. Uh, but at, at this point, the, the, the perturbation is still being applied at the optic foramen. And so the wave that I then reflect back to the optic foramen is uh, going much more quickly because it's a, a nonlinear uh, wave propagation. It then interacts with the applied pressure at the optic foramen and then reflects again back toward uh, the sclera. And so then the sclera experiences a second peak, um, which in this case is actually larger than the first peak. And so you can see that the, the, the spike here is uh, the reflected pressure coming back again the second time uh, and is slightly greater than uh, the inlet. And if you do it even more slowly again, you can actually see this effect becoming magnified. Uh, so at 0 .25, 0 0.25 seconds, you, you see a much larger spike. And then eventually, as you get to 0 0.03 seconds, it starts to dissipate again. So you, 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 this effect it, it 
essentially the, the, the way appropriation is no longer uh, as dramatic uh, because it, essentially it's um, the wave is being washed out. And if you do it even more slowly, 0 0.05, you still get a spike, but it's it's now you're getting multiple waves, multiple, multiple propagation reflection cycles uh, along the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And, and as you get slower again, you get more and more. So this one's got three full propagation reflection cycles. And as we do that, the degree of magnification uh, between inlet and uh, scleral pressure is becoming reduced. And so what you're seeing from this is there is some optimal time scale where you want to get the largest amplification in pressure. And then that effect uh, dissipates again as the uh, time scale increases. So just to sort of show that in more detail, if I plot the driving pressure on uh, the x-axis uh, and I plot the amplification factor, so that's the um, so to get the true pressure, I would multiply this factor by uh, what's on the x-axis for each part point on the curve. Uh, and so you can see that this optimal time scale is somewhere in the region of 0 0.02 seconds. <clears throat> and so this is, uh, yeah, to get the largest amplification, this is done for different uh, t's. So for uh, small t, 0 0.005, you get good amplification, but then that increases as t gets slightly longer. And then eventually it starts to decrease again until uh, the amplification is much, much smaller for t equals 0.1 seconds. <clears throat> you can think about this data in an alternative way. You can plot uh, uh, for fixed driving, uh, sorry, fixed perturbation pressure as a function of uh, time scale. And in both, you see uh, a local maximum uh, t about 0 0.02, 0 0.03 seconds <clears throat> uh, for 10 millimeters of mercury and 20 millimeters of mercury uh, pressure perturbations. <clears throat> Uh, however, if I, um, I, I said this was all done for the nonlinear tube law, uh, if I do exactly the same thing, but I do it with a uh, linear fitted tube law, the, 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 the one with n equals 1 and n equals 10, uh, I find that um, the behavior is qualitatively the same. Uh, so that's these blue curves. So the blue solid line is dp is 10 for uh, a linear tube law, and uh, the blue dashed line is dp is 20 millimeters mercury for a linear tube law. Uh, so I do see this local uh, maximum in amplification. Now in linear uh, elasticity, I can only ever see a maximum uh, of a maximum of two for my pressure amplification. You can show that from uh, the, by doing some theoretical analysis. But uh, I still see a maximal time scale, and that time scale is about 0 0.02 seconds. So even though uh, I'm using a very different constitutive law uh, with a very different stiffness parameter coming out of that constitutive law, my optimal time scale is uh, Fairly, fairly close between these two models. And so that gives us some confidence going forward that this uh, optimal time scale could be uh, uh, relatively invariant to the assumptions we're making about the elasticity. <clears throat> Uh, so then just to, to finish up this part, this is a very, uh, it's kind of a sidetrack from where we, uh, we're, uh, what, what we're talking about in retinal hemorrhaging, but essentially this, this observation uh, of the, the wave uh, propagating along at the optic nerve subarachnoid space and then being reflected and being significantly amplified as it's reflected, uh, gives us a, a possible new hypothesis for understanding bleeding of the optic nerve. So I already mentioned that uh, as one of the observations, uh, uh, which is simultaneous to retinal hemorrhaging. Essentially, the optic nerve is fed by quite a few blood vessels, which span from uh, essentially outside the optic nerve, uh, across the nerve sheath into the nerve itself. And so these blood vessels are spanning across the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And so if there is a sudden uh, change in cross-sectional area of uh, this uh, optic nerve subarachnoid space, one might expect that would produce quite large forces on uh, the blood vessels, which could cause them to rupture. And so that's a, a possible mechanism for explaining uh, bleeding of the optic nerve, which comes uh, accompanying these retinal hemorrhages. And of course, the, the, the interesting thing is that this mechanism of bleeding would be completely absent in the vitreo retinal traction models, uh, that, or sorry, vitreo retinal traction hypothesis. <clears throat> so this mechanism is giving us opt a, a, a possible uh, cause of uh, optic nerve bleeding. So that was part one. I hopefully uh, go through the other two parts um, uh, more quickly. So I just uh, summarized here the first, the, the four statements that go with the uh, Gilkes and Mann hypothesis. Uh, just to say we've now tackled point one, we've looked at a model for CSF flow along the optic nerve subarachnoid space. And we've shown that uh, by prescribing a pressure increase in the brain, we can see a propagating and reflecting wave moving along this uh, optic nerve subarachnoid space. And we can see using a nonlinear tube law, we can see a significant magnification uh, of this wave uh, as it reflects at the sclera. <clears throat> uh, but the maximum amplification actually uh, comes with uh, an optical time, uh, optimal time scale, which is relatively insensitive to some of our constitutive assumptions. <clears throat> so that's part one. And so now part two, we're going to then look at what happens to uh, the retinal blood vessels uh, as uh, 
uh, as this pressure increases in the optic nerve subarachnoid space. <clears throat> so this is work uh, that's, that was published last year in the Proceedings of Royal Society A. Uh, and again, it's with uh, Tamsin Spellman. So we've been looking at um, essentially what happens to the blood vessels that feed the eye. Now I mentioned before that those blood vessels uh, are originate through the optic nerve. So they, they, they're they coming through and entering the eye through the optic nerve, but uh, there's a little bit more to their geometry than just they're through the optic nerve. The, we actually find, and this was again due to Hera from in 1960s, these blood vessels don't, don't stay confined within the optic nerve. They're actually within the optic nerve for about 10 millimeters as they go back from the eye. And then for some reason, they uh, turn and they exit the eye. Uh, and so there's this uh, region where they then pass through the nerve sheath. They have to pass through the optic nerve subarachnoid space and then move into the extraneural space. And so in what's coming later, I'm going to call the, I'm going to label these compartments. So compartment one is what happens inside the eye. Compartment two is what happens inside the optic nerve. Compartment three is what happens as you cross the nerves, nerve sheath and basically cross the CSF space. And then region four is what happens outside the eye, or sorry, outside the, the nerve. But um, region four, although it's in the model, makes uh, zero difference to what we see. So we can effectively disregard uh, region four. So we got uh, flow, we've got going to be a pressure increase on the vessel in region three. That's my, so if I take the vessel and I sort of unfold it, I'm going to apply a large pressure increase on the outside of region three, and I want to then see what happens to the flow in region one, because region one is inside the eye, and that's the bit that the clinician can actually see. So we want to see if I squeeze the flow in uh, this region, what happens to uh, the flow in region one. And so that's, uh, again, we're going to basically produce a simple collapsible tube model for uh, the flow in this blood vessel, three variables, the area, cross local cross-sectional area, the local fluid velocity, and the local fluid pressure. And say we're particularly interested in what happens in compartment one, uh, so the bit that we could see uh, as a, as a, a clinician could see uh, as they look through into the eye. So we're going to write down a very standard model, uh, which is basically analogous to the model that I showed you a second ago for the optic nerve subarachnoid space, except now uh, our, our variable is going to be cross-sectional area. And so this is a, a 1D collapsible tube model, so it's very classical. Um, and uh, so we're again going to use conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, we take these for, this form, uh, and we've got uh, a pressure law to close our system just in the same way as we had for the ONSAS model, and that pressure law is going to take the same, essentially the same constitutive form as before, and we're going to have uh, our, so we've got uh, an inflation section area divided by A0 to the power of M, uh, where M is some exponents, and so minus some A over A0 to the power of minus N, where again N is some exponents. <coughs> Now, in this case, the elastic stiffness parameters can be uh, more directly estimated from the literature. There are uh, papers which measure uh, the properties of uh, the retinal blood vessels. Uh, and so we can then, uh, and uh, linearized wave speed is going to come up in a few seconds, but uh, we can write down explicitly in terms of M and N. And then between the, so we're going to have four different compartments, or mainly just three different compartments, and we're going to imp impose continuity of fluid flux and continuity of pressure between compartments. And so that's enough to close this system. Uh, and uh, we, the, the, the compartment lengths uh, can be taken from the measurements of HERA. So, so basically L1 and L3, that's the region in the, the retina and the region across the optic nerve subarachnoid space are about a millimeter long, whereas the region between what I call region two is about 10 millimeters long. So it's quite long compared to the other two. So if I take all that, and that's just all detail, I, I'm not uh, modify, again, we're gonna use Brooks uh, algorithm, which, uh, for, for, for solving the classical tube equations. Uh, we can, and I'm doing in this case, modify the, uh, the, the tube law a little bit by adding an extra uh, axial tension term. That axial tension just basically gives us uh, two extra derivatives in our model. So it increases the order of the model and allows us to apply two extra boundary conditions. And so those boundary conditions being continuity of area between compartments. It turns out that makes uh, very little difference qualitatively to the behavior, although uh, having uh, tension there will officially prevent a shock from forming, although the, the, um, the, 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 the interface can still get very steep. Uh, and uh, having the tension term will also generate a very short wavelength dispersive waves uh, at the front of the shock, and you'll see those in some of the profiles that I show in, in a few minutes. <clears throat> But essentially, if you compare the, the, the bulk profile of the, uh, the tube to what's uh, uh, captured using the 
uh, shock capture model with, with no tension, that they're uh, almost uh, indistinguishable apart from the, the, the small waves across the, across the interface. So just to show some uh, behavior, so what I'm going to do is just, a, uh, I'm not going to worry too much about the dynamics of uh, the, the, the precise form of the, the pressure increase in the optic nerve subarachnoid space. I'm just going to apply a pressure increase uh, for some sinusoidal form, again, with amplitude delta P and time scale capital T. But now my, my interest is more in uh, the geometry, the, the lengths of these different compartments and how that influences the behavior. So uh, it turns out that what I'm going to do is just apply this pressure externally to compartment three, and I'm going to look at what happens in compartment one. So I'll show you some profiles of compartment three in a minute, but just looking at compartment one, these are four different profiles of uh, uh, the tube cross-sectional area as a function of the coordinate x, where x equals one is um, moving uh, into the optic nerve. So this is, this is uh, inside the eye moving into the retinal circulation as you go left. <coughs> You can see three, or sorry, four different profiles. Uh, so magenta being the first one, and red, the wave is, get, is propagating uh, to uh, uh, the left as you look and becoming steeper. And as it becomes steeper, you see these uh, dispersive waves uh, at the front, which are um, quite visually striking, but really not doing much to the overall behavior. And you can see sort of the behavior is steepening to form a, a shock or an elastic jump. So essentially, we've, we've squeezed the tube and we see an elastic jump propagating into the retinal circulation. Now, this is exactly what I expected to happen, and so uh, I wasn't very surprised. But what did surprise me is that if we uh, made the length of the section uh, of the vessel uh, in the optic nerve longer, so L2 making that uh, up to its observed length in the, in, the, um, in the human body, the L2 is about 10, uh, what you find is something quite different. So now what you see in uh, region one inside the eye is that we have a much, much smaller amplitude, even though the delta P is the same as it was before. And you see uh, a wave that's very different in character. It basically extends all the way back to uh, the inlet and it's only decaying very, very slowly as you go back. <clears throat> and so I, I call it a traveling wave here. Uh, it, it, it's probably not really interpretable as a traveling wave, but essentially it's got a smooth profile with a, a long tail that goes all the way back to uh, the inlet. <clears throat> So we were kind of struck by this behavior. So this is now showing uh, both compartments. This is, this is uh, uh, on, on the left as you look, this is region one, and this is uh, compartment three with the, the, the grayed out region just showing what's happening inside of region two. I should have said that region two here is treated as being uh, entirely rigid. So you're not seeing the dynamics in there. It's just a, a, a flux and pressure conditions. To, to... And so what you see is this propagating wave. And if you look uh, for larger driving, you can eventually cause a shock to form in uh, region one. <clears throat> So you can make it happen, but, but it requires a much, much larger amplitude if the length of this compartment is uh, of physiological uh, relevance. <laughs> and so what that essentially means is that it takes much, much longer or a much, much larger amount of driving uh, to form an elastic jump. And so essentially this length of the compartment through uh, the um, uh, region two, the region through the optic nerve is uh, protecting the eye from damage. Now we've made the assumption that this region is rigid principally because the uh, the nerve fibers will be strongly constraining the vessel as, uh, as it moves through. Um, but we were kind of struck by that. I, I didn't expect this to happen at all. I expected a sort of straight up uh, wave, uh, sinusoidal wave coming in and a sinusoidal wave coming out. And so we decided to look into it in more detail. Now I'm running a bit short of time, so I'm not going to go into all the details. Essentially what we did was set up a little toy problem where we just looked at two compartments, um, now letting region two be stiff but not rigid, so it's got the same law as before, which is saying its stiffness is very, very large. And we apply our pressure perturbation as a boundary condition rather than explicitly worrying about region three. Uh, and so what we then find is that the behavior in this vessel as we change the stiffness of uh, region two is quite, uh, you can see the wave profile in region two being generated with each sequential pulse of the inlet. So you see uh, for, um, uh, this is in, in looking at compartment one as a function of x. And so you see for quite uh, well large, but not as large as I'm going to consider, stiffness of compartment two, you see an isolated waveform moving in to uh, compartment one. If you make compartment two even stiffer, you see now that the waveform, a second waveform is appearing due to a propagation reflection and they're becoming quite close together. And if I look uh, again, uh, with the even stiffer region two, I find that my waveforms have now merged together, my propagation reflection cycles have merged together, and I've got what looks very much like my uh, traveling wave behavior, my, my long, my wave with a long tail. <clears throat> 
And so um, essentially by making this compartment stiffer and stiffer, what we're transitioning to is a propagation reflection cycle, which makes this wave have its long, characteristically long TL behavior. <clears throat> Uh, and so essentially as K2 goes to infinity, these waves merge into one another and form a long traveling wave form. Now we were then able to build an analytical model of all three regions, uh, assuming a linearized dynamics, so not worrying about the nonlinear uh, wave propagation, just having a linear model. It turned out that this behavior was all entirely captured in a, a linear framework. Now I've completely run out of time to describe any of this, but you can solve the linear equations and match them together. And after, um, what you find is that the wave can be decomposed as a, as a sequence of propagations and reflections. So I say that if n indexes the prop, each, each propagation reflection cycle, I end up with uh, the profile of my G1, essentially the, 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 the profile, the, the, the amplitude of my wave uh, in region two, uh, I can write down this profile and uh, take the limit then as, as these, K, these K parameters essentially stiffness ratios. But if I then skip a few details and go straight to um, taking the limits as the stiffness of the uh, uh, region two goes to infinity, what you find is that uh, the profile in region one, in compartment one, but my, my profile inside the eye can actually be expressed as an exponential. Uh, and that exponential involves uh, x, the coordinate along the axis, but uh, uh, it's linearized wave speed times t. So this is a traveling wave or a, a wave-like coordinate moving uh, along uh, the vessel with amplitude given by e to the minus two over L2. <laughs> and so uh, this, um, this amplitude this, this is set by the length of compartment two. And so uh, the wave is decaying exponentially, but the decay rate is inversely proportional to the length of the vessel uh, through region two. And so that essentially explains what we're seeing. So if I then compare that prediction to our, uh, uh, sorry, uh, numerical simulations, uh, we can see that, well, for low well, this is L2 is equal to one tenth of the length of region one. You can see the same characteristic. You've got a decay rate. It's not an amusing representation there because the model simplifications uh, don't work so well for very, very short lengths. Uh, but you can see the profiles of the cross-sectional area and the flux. But if you then look for a much longer L2, this is now in the physiological regime where the, the length of uh, region two is about 10 times region one, you see that my, well, my numerical simulations are the solid lines and my dashed lines are the predictions of my analytic model. And you can see that it's uh, qualitatively doing really well, but also quantitatively predicting uh, this long tail pretty much perfectly. And so you can see that this uh, very slow decay is essentially my uh, one over L2 uh, kicking in whenever L2 is very large. <clears throat> Now that was uh, part two. I've um, pretty much run out of time, so I'm not going to uh, go into any detail for part three. Part three is essentially was going to be looking at what happens as uh, this waveform uh, leaves uh, the, the optic nerve and then moves through uh, the retinal circulation. Uh, so looking at what happens basically as, as an elastic jump spreads through a network, we found some quite interesting results there. Um, you can do lots of um, matching together. You can basically solve the equations uh, numerically. I'll, I'll miss out lots of the detail, but what we find, this is just one picture to show is that if you have a, uh, an elastic jump moving through uh, a bifurcation, <clears throat> You'd expect perhaps that there is a steadily propagating response in the so the one jump coming in and turning into three as it's propagated and reflected, like you would see in uh, st the theory of uh, step waves entering a bifurcation due to Pedley and others from uh, 70s and 80s. However, what we find here in this nonlinear regime is actually more complicated. That uh, beyond beyond a critical driving pressure, there is actually a loss of existence of steadily propagating shocks, and what you see instead is an oscillation at the bifurcation, where essentially the bifurcation um, acts as uh, a wave driver. Uh, uh, and so you can see that this is the, the, the wave, the blue thing is the, the wave coming in that's then reflected back, and the red thing is the transmitted wave into the bifurcation. And you can see that my, my bifurcation is essentially acting as a wave driver, driving a wave up and downstream. So I lose existence of perfectly steadily propagating solutions, and I instead end up with this oscillation, which in some cases could actually interact with the network properties. So I am very much out of time now, so I'm going to um, skip the rest of the details uh, and go, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to my conclusions. I'll just make some acknowledgements. I wanted to thank um, Tamsin, who did uh, most of the work that's shown in this talk, uh, Richard Bonchek, who is a clinical collaborator, uh, Bindi Brook for giving us uh, her code for doing these uh, nonlinear wave propagation problems in elastic vessels, uh, the participants of the 2014 uh, Mass and Medicine Study Group, 
Uh, also EPSRC for uh, two different grants, the, uh, my, my own first grant and also some work that we did through our uh, SoftMac platform grant. Uh, and so thank you for all that. And I'll just go back to my, um, uh, my conclusion slide uh, and I'll leave that up and I'll be very happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. I just noticed you got an alert about your low battery. So I'm, I'm hoping you- <laughs> I've got it plugged in now. So it's- <laughs> plugged it in. Great. That's good. So keep that slide up there. Uh, all right. It looks like uh, Matthias has, has got a question. So- uh... Let you take a, a sip first. Um, good. Are you rehydrated? Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> good. Yeah, great. Um, I had a question really about this. So the, 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 model, the, the models that you used were initially developed for you know, relatively large vessels. Uh, so the thing is, this is all fantastically small length scale. So I wondered about viscous effects, not just in the vessel itself, but also in the surrounding tissue. When you showed us some pictures initially, and that, that was really small scale, you know, you sort of say, uh, you know, the blood is flowing here, and it, it, seemed, uh, it, it seemed quite messy, right? So the, the, even the idea of a well-formed vessel uh, seemed quite, uh, an, you know, a, a necessary idealization. But I mean, what's your gut feeling? How important are viscous effects? Uh, so we, we did some relatively simplistic inclusions of viscosity. So we, inclu we yeah. included viscosity into the governing equations just by cross-sectionally averaging a Posey profile or other velocity profiles. In, in that case, it did, for the Reynolds numbers that, that we were able to estimate, it didn't make a dramatic difference. So that's just in the flow itself, it didn't make much of a difference. And there's a, an appendix to the, the proc Sock a paper where we look at the effect of viscosity. But the one thing we haven't done, and as, you measure, as you mentioned, is look at the effect of tissue vis viscoelasticity, so like viscous effects in the tissue. And, you, and you're absolutely right that there could well be very strong damping effect there. And that's something that I, I would like to look at. But as you say, it's, it becomes quite a, an involved calculation. It's really a 2D yeah. Uh, tissue calculation at that point and so that's something I haven't been brave enough to try yet True. but yeah, yeah. I, I do agree that the, the sort of viscous damping in the fatty tissue surrounding it could well um, make a difference um, okay. and probably dump out some of these effects probably I, I suspect that the effect is still there but it'll probably reduce the the, the, the strength of it and so yeah. um, um, so that, that, that's that's my feeling but I haven't tried that in, in, in okay. scholastic tissue good yeah. thanks great uh, and uh, Norman, he's got his hand up. You're unmuted, but I can't hear you. <laughs> That's just me. So in that case, while, while we wait, can I ask another one? Yeah. The, the, the yeah, medics yeah. you're working with, so I'm, I'm happy to shut up any second, right? As soon as somebody else comes in. The, the medics you're working with, um, the, the, it, it's sort of interesting is the, they often have sort of preconceptions of what's going on. And, you know, of course they deal with these things on a daily basis. Often they have very good intuition. Sometimes you sort of think that can't possibly be true. Have you had any, I mean, just in terms of working with medics, I always find it interesting. The, uh, what, was your, what were yours like? Did, do they appreciate the, the, you know, the, the sort of novel results that you found? Um, did they go, all oh, right, we hadn't thought about this or this explains something that we hadn't you know, anticipated or something? I actually presented this work at a clinical conference uh, pre-lockdown um, and, and sort of shared it with a lot of uh, uh, ophthalmic pathologists and, and they were uh, pretty interested. They, they seemed to think that it was consistent with what their, their, their intuition on the system. So there's, okay. there's lots of um, uh, there's lots of competing ideas that I sort of outlined at the start of the talk with the various mechanisms. But this the, the, sort of the ideas that I have here I'll, uh, um, seem to be in line with what they they, they, they thought. And so there's quite a few of them were, were, were quite interested in, 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 in well, the, the mechanism. I, I don't know if there's a direct use for it yet, but hopefully be, at some time they'll be able to be able to be developed into some sort of predictive tool that could be used for interpreting images. And so there, there was certainly mm -hmm. a lot of interest in that. And yeah, they, they, I think they do get a, a, a sense that this this pressure rise hypothesis um, and the way that I've modeled it is is leading somewhere useful for them. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I suppose we can't rule out the other mechanism, the vitreo retinal traction, um, but and probably there's really need to do some modeling on that too to be able to to, to, to rule it out or, or rule it in uh, but yeah they, they seemed interested in, in, in this kind of idea okay thanks 
so no one typed out his question because I'm in microphone problems. So uh, he's asked um, about the strain rate, uh, strain rate uh, in the wall of the um, the onsas. I can't remember what the middle the A stands for in that, okay. with a with a shock wave propagating. Um, uh, so I haven't computed that directly, but th that would be easy, easy to the, the, the rate of the rate of expansion would be very easy to calculate. It, it will be rather rapid uh, as as we as uh, you know everything's propagating very very quickly. And so I, I do expect that the the elastic wall that I'm using, elastic wall model that I'm using, is is overly simplistic uh, and would need to be refined before we could ever claim that this was exactly what's happening. Uh, and so it's, I think it's, there's a follow-up saying, is, is it rapid enough to damage the wall? Uh, the uh, stiffness of the dura matter, whenever we looked into sort of the the the, um, uh, the tearing properties of the, uh, uh, fra the fracture criterion essentially of, of, of uh, dura matter is very, very stiff. It's very, very, sorry, not stiff, sorry, very, very um, tough. The fracture toughness is, 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 is large. And so it didn't seem to me that the strain rates we were generating were large enough to be able to tear either the sclera or uh, the dura matter, but that's, um, you know, again, I need to do some more work on that. And the, and the study that I was looking at on the estimates of the fracture toughness were were quite old. So um, there may need to be more work done on that to be able to, 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 to verify that completely. But we, we did do a study, or at least a preliminary study on, on, on a tearing of the of the, um, the dura matter and sclera and confirmed, uh, sort of able to decide that it wasn't a significant effect here. But presumably it would be as soon as the driving pressure became large enough. But for the sort of range that I'm looking at here, it is. And indeed, I think that's what's seen clinically, that there isn't often rupture of the dura or the sclera. It's more um, uh, bleeding and, 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 and um, lots of, lots of um, broken blood vessels rather than destruct complete destruction of the tissue anyway. Um, yeah. Uh a couple more questions on uh, that don't know who was first. Uh, so, uh, Andrew? Igor was first. Okay, <laughs> Igor. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for a really nice talk. I just wonder for, for the kind of first part where you had the uh, kind of energy focusing or kind of amplification of the wave, does it depend on the properties of the sclera? So, if it's elastic rather than solid, will it dampen the wave? And so yes, I expect it would. Um, but again, the, the sclera is pretty stiff. On the scale of the eye, the sclera is pretty stiff. It's, it's essentially the stiffest tissue in the eye. Uh, so it, it would make an effect, and it would dampen it. It would absorb some of the elastic energy. Uh, but I, we haven't tried that. And that's again the calculation that I, I th would be very interesting to do, doing a sort of a full uh, two or even three dimensional uh, elastic tissue for the sclera, and then looking at reflections. But you know, I haven't tried that yet. Uh, I'll I'll jump in now. Thanks, very nice stuff, Peter. On the propagation through bifurcations, was that a symmetric bifurcation? Yes, that that, that was. Um, we, we, we said, so I wanted to include that. Just um, I know there's a lot of interest in bifurcations and things in, in Manchester, just to sort of show the the effect here with the shock waves. We haven't really done much on that yet. That's sort of still in its early stages, and so I would like to start looking at asymmetry uh, and, um, and try and understand. This propagation problem in more detail, uh, but yeah, and potentially even the effect of resonance as well with, the, with this, well, this wave driver and and, and the, the network structure. But yeah, we're still early stages with that. Okay, yeah. So I was wondering whether you had a the right or the wrong sort of asymmetry could could yeah, either bit, kill um, it off or completely or resonate. The, the, well, I, I have a PhD student hopefully starting in, in uh, September and we're hoping to uh, spend part of, the, of her project looking at um, extracting. So we've got a bank of retinal images from, from a clinical collaborator and we're going to try and extract some actual images of, of, of actual retina uh, oh, okay. geometry and then use that as a, a way to try and benchmark the model in the asymmetry in particular because be, that'll be, give us a way to, without having to impose, we could, we could impose something uh, sort of fake something, but this this will give us a give us a much more robust way of uh, of incorporating a summary. So that's that's something that's sort of uh, on in the pipeline, but not quite there yet. Sounds good. Thank you.